Okay, in this video we're going to prove this very, very special case of Fermat's last theorem. So we're going to prove that the equation x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth has no uh, non-negative integer solutions. <coughs> So the point of this proof is really to show that with relative simplicity we can prove this very simple um, case of Fermat's last theorem, but the full Fermat's last theorem proof using many parts of modern mathematics which we don't need in this proof. Okay, so let's recall the notion of a primitive Pythagorean triple as we'll need it in the proof. So a primitive Pythagorean triple is a triple of numbers x, y, z, and uh, the GCD of that triple is 1 and they're given by the following parameterization. So we have x is s squared minus t squared, y is 2s, and z is s squared plus t squared, and we have the GCD of s and t are 1, and they have opposite parity. So 1 is even and 1 is odd, which tells us that 1 of x or y is even or odd, and generally we take the second one, y, to be even which is what we did down here in the parameterization. So I'll let you look. I've got a video on primitive Pythagorean triples if you want, um, but now let's get going with this proof. So we're actually going to prove something a little bit stronger, and that's the following. So um, we'll prove the equation x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared has no solution with natural numbers x, y, and z. And let's see why this is enough. Because if um, there is a solution to our equation 1 up here, our Fermat last theorem um, type equation, and let's call that solution x, y, z, then um, x comma y comma z squared um, is a solution to, um, let's call this maybe equation number two. Good. So if we can show that equation number two does not have a solution, then automatically equation number one also doesn't have a solution. So now we're going to approach this proof uh, towards a contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's assume uh, x1, y1, and z1 solve equation 2. So in other words, we have x1 to the fourth plus y1 to the fourth equals z1 squared. And now let's set the GCD of um, x1 and y1 to be equal to d. But now, notice, that means that we can write um, x1 equals d times x2. We can write y1 equals d times y2. And then the GCD of x2 and y2 uh, is 1, so they're relatively prime. And then, also, this equation is going to become the following. We'll have uh, d to the fourth x2 to the fourth plus y2 to the fourth equals z1 squared. So what that tells us is that d to the fourth divides z1 squared, which tells us that uh, d squared divides z1, which means we can write z1 equals d squared z2. Okay, good. So what that tells us is that we can put all of this together. So we can put this expression for x1, this expression for x2, and this expression, sorry, for y1, and this expression for z1, and see that we have the following. Um, x2, y2, and z2 solve 2 with the GCD of x2 and y2 equals 1. So in fact we have a solution to this where x and y are relatively prime. Okay good, so what I'm going to do now is clean up the board and then we'll start uh, the next part of the proof.
Okay, so let's recall that we have x2, y2, and z2 satisfy the following. So we have x2 to the fourth plus y2 to the fourth equals z2 squared, and we have the GCD of x2 and y2 is one, so they're relatively prime. So we have that type of solution. Now we, what we want to assume is um, that this solution has the property that the z value is minimum. So let's make that assumption as well. So assume we have uh, the solution uh, with the z part is a minimum. And so, how do we know that even exists? Well, notice we're taking x, y, and z to be natural numbers. So, of all the solutions, we can take their z parts, and that forms a subset of the natural numbers. But all subsets of the natural numbers are bounded from below by the Archimedean principle. And so, what we'll do is take all solutions to this equation that satisfy the property x squared, sorry, x2 and y2 are relatively prime, take their z parts, form that set, and then take the minimum one. Okay, so now we're good to keep going. So let's notice that x2 squared, y2 squared, z2 forms a primitive Pythagorean triple. So forms a primitive Pythagorean triple. So I'll shorten that as follows. Okay, so that means we can write x2 squared as m squared minus n squared. We can write y2 squared as 2mn. And we can write z2 is equal to um, m squared plus n squared. Okay, good. And then also notice we have the GCD of m and n is 1, and they have opposite parity. And again, that's by the description of primitive Pythagorean triples, which I have in another video, um, which obviously we went over at the beginning. Okay, so the next thing that we want to notice is that we can take this and we'll see that uh, x2 squared plus m squared equals n squared. So this is another primitive Pythagorean triple. So let's write that down. So another primitive Pythagorean triple. So uh, we can do the same thing with x2, m, and n that we did with x2 squared, y2 squared, and z2 squared. In other words, we can write x2 equals um, a squared minus b squared, m equals 2ab, and then n equals a squared plus b squared, and then the same setup. So we have the GCD of A and B is 1, so they're relatively prime and they have opposite parity. Now we're ready to finish this off. So let's notice x2 squared, y2 squared, z2 were primitive Pythagorean triples. We have parameterized them with these parameters m and n, which satisfy the following. We have the GCD of m and n is 1. m is the even one and n is the odd one. So uh, they need to have opposite parity, so we'll make that choice. And then uh, this GCD along with this assumption means that the GCD of 2m and n is also 1. Then we have a parameterization for this as a primitive Pythagorean triple, x2, m, n, in terms of these parameters a and b, and we have the GCD of a and b as one, and they have opposite parity. So now the next thing we want to notice is the following. So we have uh, y2 squared equals 2m times n. So I've put it in parentheses for grouping because we know that these two are relatively prime and they're multiplying to a perfect square. So that means each of them are perfect squares. So 2m and n are perfect squares. So uh, let's uh, work with 2m first. So that means we can write 2m as an even perfect square. We know that every even perfect square is a multiple of 4, so we can write 2m equals uh, 4c squared, which tells us that m equals 2c squared. Good. But then also, m equals 2ab. So we can set this equal to 2ab because of this parameterization up here which tells us 
that uh, c squared equals a b. And now we're back into the same game. We have two relatively prime natural numbers whose product is a perfect square, but that tells us that a and b are perfect squares. So now uh, we're almost all done. So what we'll do is we'll set a equal to x3 squared. So it's a perfect square, so we can set it to a perfect square. We can set b equal to y3 squared. And then finally, we'll set n equal to, so we know it's a perfect square, so we'll set that equal to z3 squared. Okay, fantastic, but finally what we're going to do is rewrite this equation, and notice if we take this equation and rewrite it using this substitution, which we just proved all these were perfect squares, we get the following. We get x 3 to the 4th plus y 3 to the 4th equals z 3 squared. In other words, another solution for what we called equation number 2 at the very beginning of the video. But now we want to look at the following inequality. So we'll look at 0, which is less than z 3. So notice everything's been taken from the natural numbers here. So that means uh, 0 hasn't been a possibility for any, any of these. So 0 is uh, uh, less than z3, which is less than or equal to z3 squared. Good, but that's equal to n by our kind of assumption here. But that's less than or equal to n squared. But now that is strictly less than m squared plus n squared. But that's equal to z2. So notice what we have here, if we read this part, this part, and this part, we have a z part of the solution to our equation 2, which is strictly less than what we said was the minimal such solution. So now notice we've just contradicted the minimality of Z2, which uh, is a, finishes the proof. Okay, we're done.